Hi, and welcome to part two of chapter 10, Fixed Income Securities. We're going to continue where we left off, and we left off at bond ratings. So bond ratings are a way of <clears throat> understanding where a bond is as far as its risks, and specifically risks that derive from its underlying issuer, either corporate or government. So these bond rating agencies <clears throat> put together pretty extensive analysis on companies to assess the credit risk and associate that with the bond issue to give a rating similar to sort of like a grade you get in the class. Such companies such as Moody, Standards & Poor's, Fitch, these are bond rating agencies and they issue a similar set, they're slightly different between which agency of letters corresponding with the credit risk. So let's just talk about how this works. So a financial strength of a company <clears throat> and their stability and, and ability to pay long-term dividends are gonna be associated with the rating. So high ratings are associated with companies that are more reliable. They have less debt as a form of financing, so they might have issued equity. They're a liquid company with plenty of liquid assets. They have strong and dependable cash flows, and they have little to no trouble servicing any debt that they may have. So <clears throat> investment grade bonds, these are bonds that are gonna be the best bonds to invest in, typically the top four ratings. And they're gonna, they're gonna be bonds that are very, very strong companies that are very uh, well run and have strong set of financials. And then you have junk bonds. And since companies don't like to be called junk, we switch that to high yield bonds to make it sound a little less um, upsetting to companies whose corporate bonds get labeled as junk bonds. So these bonds are below investment grade, meaning that their issuers have some problems and some challenges. <clears throat> now a split rating occurs when a bond issue is given a different rating by the different rating agencies. So, so sometimes they don't always all agree. And the ratings do change as financial conditions change, as economic realities change, and the ratings that are, are issued have to be reviewed pretty regularly to make sure that they're still valid. And this will tend to be issuing upgrades and downgrades. Now let's look at the two biggest rating agencies, Moody's and S&P. <clears throat> so Moody's top score is, is um, uppercase A, lowercase A, lowercase A, or sometimes called just called triple A. And the, so the S&P uses just uppercase letters in from triple A down to D. <clears throat> so when you move from triple A to double A, you move from a very high grade investment status, uh, where it's the, you know, the highest grade they give, basically very rarely given and denotes just an extremely reliable, almost risk-free investment where the high grade is still high quality, but there are some, some issues that make it not as strong as AAA. And then you have A, which is a medium grade um, investment, B, with its, which is a medium grade investment with some concerns. And then starting with BB, we get to speculative issues uh, all the way to the C bonds. C and D bonds are basically default, very poor. The company may be in default, the fa danger of default, bankruptcy issues, so you want to stay away from these. So this is a way of when you're investing in corporate bonds or even different government bond, bonds around the world, these agencies will give you an idea of how good the bonds are, how safe they are for investing. And in turn, these ratings will help influence the amount of interest rate that these, these bonds will pay for bondholders. So the ratings are tied to the bond yields. The higher the rating, the lower the yield. So AAA bonds typically pay the lowest around amount of interest on their bonds because they have the lowest amount of risk. So the bond agency's ratings impact um, bonds um, to a high degree. And the rating is going to be also impacted by how sensitive the price is to interest rate movements. So a particular bond so shorter term bonds are less sensitive to interest rate changes than longer term bonds, and that can affect the rating as well.
Now, of course, you remember that bond price sensitivity is tied to interest rates as well as a company's financial performance. So the bond ratings are going to reflect the bond sensitivity to interest rate changes, which is mostly influenced by the, the remaining term of the bond <clears throat> and the financial performance of the company. You know, so the bond ratings serve um, to help keep inv individual investors informed and, you know, cuts down the time and the cost of doing this credit analysis on your own. So bond ratings are meant to measure the issues default risk. Um, so rating agencies, they are not perfect though. So these ratings, which are meant to help investors better understand the, the, the credit worthiness of companies, you know, they can make mistakes in this analysis. They can miss things or things could actually happen that they didn't anticipate that greatly affect the performance of the company. Now, so let's talk about the bond market. The, as far as a market, it's mostly over the counter, <clears throat> which is similar to the NASDAQ. And it's a far, a far more stable market than the stock market. And it has been growing rapidly for a number of years as governments have greatly expanded their borrowing and it has companies have greatly expanded their bar borrowing. So the U.S. bond market is quite a, quite a bit larger than the U.S. stock market, which a lot of people don't realize that the U.S. bond market is actually a higher valuation than the U.S. stock market. And, you know, it's just because the bond market is a little bit sleepier that people don't realize how, you know, truly gigantic the bond market is. And that could be, you know, not just the U.S., but the bond market around the world. So let's just talk a little bit more about treasury bonds issued by the U.S. Because these bonds are, even if you're in a different country, these bonds are, are worth noting because they can still be connected to other foreign bonds as the basis of comparison or, or basis of risk, changing of interest rates. <clears throat> so the U.S. Treasury is the one that issues the Treasury bonds and the Treasury obligations that are backed by the full faith of the United States government. So why is that important? Well, the United States government is the largest economy in the world So, w with some of the richest citizens in the world. So it has a high um, margin of error and it has the ability to raise what I mean by that is it has the ability to raise taxes or collect taxes on a very large economy on very large corporations and very wealthy individuals. So that helps secure the, the receipts needed to pay the interest on these bonds, which the uh, permanence of the U.S. government helps to keep the risks very low. Some, some treasuries are considered risk-free even. <clears throat> so when we talk about treasury notes, we're talking about any maturities that are 10 years or less, uh, but greater than one year. So two to 10 years. Treasury bonds typically have a maturity of 30 years. So the interest paid on, on the United States treasuries are semi-annually, which, which means semi-annually means twice a year. And the treasury bonds are, the US treasury bonds are exempt from the state and local taxes. <clears throat> and this is because the when the U.S. was formed as a country, they the states had more power initially than the federal government, and the states did not want the federal government to have the ability to cut off a state's ability to raise money. And if the federal government decided, um, and vice versa, the the federal government didn't want the state to have the ability to, to highly tax government treasuries and prevent the federal government from raising funds. So in, in many cases when uh, the treasuries are issued, they're exempt from state and local taxes, so they're free of influence from the states. And when a state releases a bond called a municipal bond, it's free of federal taxes as well. So the two governing bodies can't disrupt their ability to raise funds. <clears throat> so today's treasuries are only non-callable non securities. And the treasury issues 
uh, its securities regularly through what they call treasury auctions. And it's the, big, the biggest bond market is the U.S. Treasury market as far as a single class of bonds. Now, here's an example of a treasury auction. They'll tell the type of security being auctioned, the 30-year bond, the issue date, the maturity date, the yield, interest rate, I should say, in the bond, the, um, the yield, the high yield, and then the price of the bond, which is close to the issuing price of 100%. Uh, so we'll look at what's tenured, non-competitive, non-competitive, what's accepted, and then the total. So even though they might tenure 40 billion here, but what's accepted at the auction is only about 17 billion. Uh, so let's talk about inflation could be a big issue <clears throat> at some part, of, some part of your life. So right now, you probably have many, many, many years left to live. And even though inflation may not be um, a big issue right now, but at some point in your life, I'm betting inflation will be, become a bigger issue. So when people were worried more about inflation, the Treasury had an opportunity to issue a new type of bond called uh, a TIPS. And there's a Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So these are securities that offer investors an opportunity to stay ahead of inflation by adjusting the returns for any indication of inflation has occurred. So the maturity of these bonds, the interest they, the flat in, um, interest they pay is very low, but they add inflation on top of it. So that way the interest rate stated on the treasury bond is a real return because they're compensating you for any inflation that has occurred. So it eliminates any purchasing power risk. And it uh, helps to um, makes these bonds uh, a lot less risky than ordinary bonds because you don't have to worry about inflation eating all of the return of the bond. Now, as far as agency bonds, these are a type of government issue, but through a through a secondary agent agency of the U.S. government. So you have a federal home loan bank, federal farm credit systems, small business administration, uh, small loan, uh, student loan marketing association, and federal national mortgage association. So these are high quality securities with very less, low risk of default with a direct tie to the US government, but they provide yields slightly higher than treasuries because they're sort of protected behind the treasuries. Uh, so treasuries would make sure to be paid first, then the agency bonds. And this is a way of the government making funds available to citizens for things that they want to promote. They want to promote citizens to buy houses. They want to promote the farming market. They want to promote small businesses. They want to promote students going to school. You know, so that's why they have these agencies to help foster affordability in loans to, to move the, comp the country in a certain direction, home ownership and college education. So here are some characteristics of some of the agency bills. So this would be the different agencies. There's a few here extra that I didn't list. The, the minimum denomination of their bond, the initial maturity, and the status as their tax status, which is if they're exempt. So some are exempt from state and local, uh, but typically government bonds, US government bonds and agency bonds are not tax exempt from the federal level, just the state and local level for the most part. Where you can see here, there are some exceptions with uh, housing and uh, mortgage and farming agencies. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about municipal bonds, nicknamed munis. These come from counties, cities, states, uh, and can be as small as a school district or as large as the full state. So a municipal bond, is something local governments can issue to raise funds to help for community-based or government-based projects. Now, the municipal bonds can quite often be triple tax-free. They can be federal, state, and local tax-free, which makes it desirable. And it also helps lower the rate of interest they pay on these bonds, which makes them very affordable for these government agencies. I should say uh, local, state, and municipalities also. There are two general types of these municipal bonds. General obligation bonds, which are backed by the full faith and credit of the state or the city or the county. So you're just relying on their ability to 
uh, to operate as a state and pay their bills. And there's also revenue bonds, which could be generated from a specific project that is going to be, uh, the money's gonna be used to build. Maybe it's building a bridge or a tunnel, and they can put a toll on that. Maybe it's used to build a stadium, and they can take a part of the revenues of the stadium. So since these are backed by municipal guarantees, um, they have an additional source of collateral in form of insurance. So the bonds are also insured against default. So the quality of these bonds are very high uh, and it has, they generally have pretty good liquidity. And they're great for, you know, if you have a lot of money and you pay in your high tax bracket already and you earn a lot of money, the municipal bonds are a good way to invest money and also lower your tax profile. So here's something uh, I'm going to talk about this, but I'm going to follow it up with a video with an Excel spreadsheet showing how this is calculated. But there's a formula here. There's two equations. Fully taxable yield uh, and then fully taxable yield for both state and federal municipal bonds. So this would look at the taxable equivalent yield for something that was uh, federal tax-free. And this would look at a, a equivalent yield for something that was state and federal tax-free. Now, the we say taxable equivalent because we want to see what's the equivalent rate of return for tax-exempt bonds compared to corporate bonds. So this is able to convert the rate of municipals and treasuries into a rate that'd be comparable with corporate bonds. That's why we call it taxable equivalent. Uh, so we can get a better idea, because in some cases it might be better if risks, risks are the same to invest in a corporate bond at a higher yield than a municipal bond at a lower yield, even after you fact out the benefits of tax deduction. So we can see here, this is the tax-free yield, and this is the federal tax bracket. So if you're in the 35% tax bracket, a 5% tax-free yield becomes really comparable to the 7.69% in a corporate sense. So if I had a choice between investing in a 7% tax-free or a 10% corporate bond, I would choose the tax-free bond because it's the equivalent yield of 10.77 on the corporate scale. However, if the corporate bond actually paid 11 or say 12%, then I would choose the corporate bond because that would be paying higher than the tax-free bond. So this little table here is the equivalent rate. Uh, and this is basically using figuring out how much taxes you'd pay on the taxable bond to, to incorporate with the tax-free rate to figure out the, the equivalency rate. So that way you can really, you could more better judge which bond would give a better yield for you. So let's talk about some major market segments. So we have the corporate bonds and, and corporations issue in four major segments, industrials, public utilities, transportation, and financial services. So these are the four biggest segments of the corporate bonds. And there's a huge variety of quality and different types of bonds available because there are so many different corporations that are issuing corporate bonds. And they're pretty popular uh, and, li and liquid uh, and then high demand because they pay steady, predictable levels of income. There's also something called an equipment trust certifi certificate. So this is a special type of corporate bond, and it can be issued by airlines, railroad, um, uh, trucking companies, uh, boating uh, companies that deliver transport over, over um, ships like cargo ships. And it's used to purchase the equipment that's going to serve as collateral for the bond. So it's specific corporate bond backed up by equipment. There are also something called the zero coupon bonds. These are like savings bonds. So they pay no interest, but you buy the bond at a discount from its par value. So you could buy a zero coupon bond. It's a 30 year bond. It's a thousand dollar par value, but you buy it at $500. Now, when the uh, zero, zero coupon bond pays no interest during that life of the bond, but when it, when it expires, when it reaches its maturity, it pays you the full par value. So you invested 500 and then you, they pay you 1,000, so you made a $500 profit. Although interest still must be reported as it's accrued for tax purposes, but no interest is actually received. So sort of a downside on the tax side of that. Um, but these are sometimes popular because uh, you can get 
you can get them in small increments. You can get like a um, hundred dollar. You want to buy a hundred dollar zero coupon savings bonds, and then you only pay fifty dollars for it. And you can give it to somebody as a gift, like usually maybe uh, a young child. But it's where they literally pay no interest until the bond is matured. Now, a mortgage-backed security is a type of debt that's backed by a pool of mortgages. So this is where they'll, they'll take maybe 7,000 mortgages. They'll collateralize it um, and sell it as a bond, but it's sort of like a piece of 1,000 mortgages. So they're thereby sort of eliminating the effect of um, one or two housing defaults because it's in such a large pool. So the monthly, so this is what's great about mortgage-backed securities or bonds is they pay monthly dividends. Um, so that's nice because you get these monthly uh, dividend payments from these mortgage-backed bonds, uh, and they're they're actually the preliminary, the agencies that issue them are going to be Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae. Uh, and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation. Um, so they're self-liquidating investments since a portion of the monthly cash flow is also repayment of principal. So it's sort of like a term bond. So these are actually pretty popular bonds. Now, a collateralized mortgage obligation is one step further. This is a CMO. So this is where um, it's a little bit different than a mortgage-backed bond. Uh, which is a pool of mortgages, but the collateralized mortgage obligations is a mortgage-backed bond pool that's divided into small tranches, which are slices uh, or classes of investors, uh, based on whether that you want a short, interim, or longer-term investment. So, principal payments uh, go first uh, into the shortage, tr the shortage length of time tranche, and then finally until they're retired until the next sequence is paid. So these are, um, there's some complexity here. There's some prepayment risk uh, and there's different levels of prepayment risk because mortgages are often refinanced and collateralized or mortgage obligations. Uh, you know, that led to one piece of the Great Recession in 2007, 2008, when um, the U.S. mortgage, collateralized mortgage market was so highly, um, rated as in safety when in reality it wasn't where there was a lot more mortgages being out there that was highly highly risky and defaulted eventually now you could take this securitization idea and just you know think about any asset so you can create any asset backed securitization where they transform assets into some kind of marketable security so it's backed by it could be backed by auto loans uh, so how is an auto loan asset? Well, if you're the one issuing the auto loans, that's your asset because that's going to be, be paid back to you with interest. Um, so auto loans, credit card bills, home equity, lines, uh, computer leases, hospital receivables, small business loans, truck rentals. These are all things that can be asset-backed securities. So basically, the, um, the corporation will sell their loan portfolio to be collateralized and sold back to investors. So the corporations get their money back. So if you're, say you uh, lease airline planes, airplanes, and that's, you can have a lot of money tied up in these leases, but if you collateralize those leases, the uh, financial markets will pay you that money back, and then you can go ahead and buy more planes and lease more planes. It's a way of cycling the money around more. You get higher yields, typically they're shorter maturities, and you get interest and principal payments monthly. So the, and these can be pretty high quality. And then since they're backed by assets, uh, any default risk is, is tempered by the fact that the assets can be recollected and resold. Now, junk bonds, which I had explained to you before, we like to call them high yield bonds, is just very speculative, low um, uh, sub-investment grade type of security, C and D level investments. And they're subordinate debentures for risky companies and but they can have typically very high yields and the prices you know tend to be more like stocks and bonds the price is a lot more volatile and they're a lot more subject to economic changes but junk bonds if you i mean some of the companies in the junk bond category uh won't be there for long 
and they're probably up and coming companies, they may elevate their bonds out of junk at a certain point as their business and profits grow. So if you can pick the right companies that the, where the risks are actually much lower, you can actually make a lot of money investing in junk bonds. But again, it's like stocks. You have to pick the companies that are going to continue to do better. A PIK bond is an unusual type of junk bond. So it stands for payment in kind. So rather than paying the bond's coupon, um, in cash, the issuer can make annual interest payments in the form of additional debt. So it's sort of like uh, your par value grows. So say in the first five to 10 years of the loan, instead of paying you interest, they're just increasing the, um, the amount of par value or debt. Um, so you may have lent them $1,000, but they start adding the interest to what you lent them. So basically you're lending them the interest too. So by the time they're done, maybe that bond with, that started out of $1,000 per value is now more like 1500 because they've incorporated the interest payments they didn't pay you into the debt part of that bond. And it's a way of issuing a bond where it gives the company a little breathing room and some time to make money on their investments before paying any interest on it. Now, as far as the global view of the bond market, there are huge amounts of money in the global markets in foreign bonds and you know so if you want to be have a well diversified bond portfolio you should be looking at foreign bonds different foreign corporations foreign governments um now a lot of the risk of these foreign bonds will deal with the currency fluctuations if you're going to return the proceeds back to the to into dollars at some point uh, now of course as i said before the u.s has the biggest bond market followed by japan China, and several EU countries. Now, if you put the EU countries together as one block, they, they become significantly larger part of the world's bond market. But typically, Germany, Italy, and France account for more than 90% of that region's bond market. Together, these countries, US, Japan, China, and uh, um, EU countries, they, they control about 90% of the world's bond market. Now, there are some foreign bonds that dollar denominated. So what we call a Yankee bond can be issued by a far, foreign government, say like um, the government of Denmark, and they can issue this uh, foreign bond, you know, but it's going to be issued and traded in the U.S. exchanges. It registered with the SEC, all transactions are in dollars, and there's no currency risk. Why would the Danish government or the French government or the English government issue Yankee bonds? Well, the biggest reason would be because the U.S. market is so liquid and there's so much demand for bonds in dollars that they want to, they want to move from their very local and small market to a much bigger market. Now, some of this Yankee bond demand has has alleviated as the EU, EU has come together as a um, economic block and started and have a base currency of the euro. But not all countries in the European Union participate with the euro, such as Sweden and Denmark have their own currencies that are, that are not euro denominated. So in that case, they would want to issue some sort of Yankee bond, perhaps to help raise funds in a larger bond market. So there are also euro dollar bonds. So these are bonds that are traded and issued outside the U.S. that are not registered with the ECC, SEC. So the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, they do register the Yankee bonds, but if it's not registered with them, it's more likely a euro bond, which is a euro market that's trying to be uh, exclusively outside of U.S. control. So it's aimed at investors and institutions that want to have... Um, want to have investments in dollars, but don't want to deal with the U.S. government or the U.S. government's ability to uh, regulate banks or in, in some cases are looking to avoid um, sanctions like, a, you know, a government of China, Russia, Iran. Uh, they may want to avoid the U.S. government's ability to interfere with their dollar denominated funds. Now, let's look at U.S. pay versus foreign pay bonds. So foreign pay bonds, these are bonds denominated in another country, in another currency other than U.S. dollars. So they're issued and traded overseas, not, not registered with the SEC. So German government bonds are payable in euros. 
Japanese bonds issued in yen. So they're subject to exchange rate risk. So, so foreign pay bonds are basically bonds that are, are denominated in a foreign currency. So if you invest in those bonds, and sometimes you might want to invest in those bonds because they could pay much higher yields, you still have to convert it back to US terms and that's going to affect the currency. So here's a, here's a basic formula equation 10.3, uh, how to do that conversion. Now, speaking of conversions, we have convertible bonds. And these are exciting bonds because they convert into stock. So it's a way of investing in a company and having the ability to take advantage of um, bonds that can convert into stock. Uh, now, what's great about this is if you, uh, and say Amazon did a lot of these in the beginning where they had issued a lot of convertible bonds and they had the bonus of being able to turn into stock at a certain price. And that helped make them less risky and more possible a higher return. So that lowered to, led to lower interest rates on them for the issuer, Amazon. So there's sort of a form of equity uh, and they're convertible into equity, but they first they first are basically born. They're like a, a butterfly. They're born as a bond, but they can transform into stock at a later point uh, if it's valuable enough. You can always choose not to transform. Now, these are popular with investors because of this equity uh, portion or what they call an equity kicker, which is right to convert the bonds into common stock. And the price of the conversion um, is going to be listed in the bond. And that helps the price of the bond uh, be more reactive to the price of the stock. So they can be issued as convertible bonds or sometimes called convertible prefer preferreds. And it's because they're related to or maybe transform. They're more related to a preferred stock. Um, okay. So convertible notes and bonds. So there are convertible notes that are similar to convertible bonds that do transform into, can transform into stock, but with shorter maturities. Sometimes it could be a forced conversion. Um, so the, the, the bondholder has a right to convert the bond at any time. Uh, and more often than not, the issuer, issuing firm indicates the conversion by calling the bonds. So that would be a forced conversion when the something the issuer does that's going to force them to convert to stock. Now, a couple, couple key things to think about with um, convertible securities and convertible conversion privilege. So conversion privilege is the key element of a convertible that stipulates the, the conversion feature conditions. So each bond, think of bonds as like a small contract. So each contract can be a little bit different about how the bond converts into stock. So there could be a conversion period, which is a time period at which the uh, issue can be converted into stock. There's a conversion ratio that will denote the number of common shares of stock received uh, um, by each bond. So if about one bond is $1,000, they'll denote how many shares of stock that will convert to. Typically, it's a price that's above the current stock price. Otherwise, people would buy these bonds and instantly convert them into stock. So the, so the conversion price is always the price higher than the market when the bond is first issued. And hopefully the stock price moves up faster to a point where the stock price is above the conversion price at some point during the life of the bond. Otherwise, you wouldn't convert. Now, a Lion is a liquid option, liquid yield option note is the acronym for that. So it's a zero coupon convertible bond that is convertible at a fixed conversion ratio for the life of the bond. So remember, zero coupon, bond, zero coupon bonds was paying no interest and it has a conversion feature and a put option. So there's no current income, but no limit on potential capital appreciation. And the put option allows security to be sold back to the issuer at a specific price, providing downside protection. So this would be example of if you want to get into a riskier type of company and you want to you want to have the ability to participate in the stock appreciation, but you want some sort of protection against the the, the stock going down or the or the you know uh, company becoming less valuable, this is just sort of a hybrid type of bond convertible bond to um, manage those risks more. Okay, so sources of value the 
The value of the convertible is based, of course, on both the stock and the bond dimensions of the securities. So convertibles trade much like the common stocks, which is quickly tied to the market price of the stock. And as the stock, as the current stock price um, increases and gets closer to or exceeds the conversion price, then the bond is going to gain more value. Uh, so convertible trades, they're going to trade much like a bond in the market when the market price of the stock is well below the conversion price. But when the conversion price exceeds the stock price, it's going to trade more like a stock. So think of the bond prices, so the, the, the floor price in case the stock never goes up or never passes the conversion point. So to calculate the conversion value would be the conversion ratio times the current market price of the stock. So the convert ratio, conversion ratio is how many shares of stock you'll get by converting the bond and you multiply it by the current stock price. And the, the, the current equivalent would be the current market price of the current bond divided by the current ratio. So just two formulas we could work with at that. And the conversion premium would be the conversion premium in dollars divided by the conversion value. So the conversion uh, premium is the extent at which the market price of the convertible exceeds the conversion value. So this means that investors are willing to pay a premium because of the added additional or current income relative to the underlying stock because of the convertible's potential upside. The payback period, this looks measures the length of time it will take to recover the conversion premium from the extra interest income earned on the convertible. So really basically, if I'm paying extra money to get this conversion premium, how long will the interest, how long in, in, in interest payments will it take in measured, usually in months to get that uh, money back that is equivalent to the premium. Uh, and finally, the value of a conversion convertible. So the investment value is gonna be the price at which the bond would trade if it were a non-convertible and if it were priced at near or equivalent prevailing market yields of comparable non-convertible bonds. So that's the investment value. So the present value of the coupon stream and its par value are discounted at the rate equal to the prevailing yield on comparable non-convertible -com uh, issues. So that's just a little statement about how you could value this, the investment value of the convertible. Now that's the, this is the end of chapter 10. The next chapter in chapter 11, I'm going to be going into the formulas, some of them that were touched upon in this chapter, but more specific formulas on bond valuation to how the bond values are calculated, how the par value and how the cash flows are discounted to come up with a current value on the bond. So that will be chapter 11. I look forward to talking to you then. Take care.